because there is hemorrhage in the subarachnoid space, then there will be seepage of blood in the uh, retina, right? Okay, because as you know, the optic nerve is covered by the meninges, right? The dura matter, the arachnoid matter, and the pia matter. And therefore, it also has uh, subarachnoid space. So naturally, you know, okay, this area will also be uh, occupied by CSF, and therefore blood, if there is bleeding. All right, so you will see this, what we call subhyaloid hemorrhage, okay? See, here it's it's very obvious, right? You have this, and uh, it looks like uh, something that looks like air fluid level, right? Air here and air fluid here, which is the hemorrhage. You can see the marking, the boundary, okay? All right, headache may also be due to intracerebral aneurysm. So don't you know, aneurysm is the outpouching of the wall of the artery, right? And aneurysm can uh, appear anywhere in the major arteries, especially in the arteries of the circle of Willis, right? Okay. And the most common site or location is an aneurysm of the middle cerebral artery, 29%. All right. And just, just like what we talked about yesterday, if you have an aneurysm here at the posterior communicating artery, it may compress the oculomotor nerve because the oculomotor nerve is parallel to the posterior communicating. And therefore, it will cause pupillary dilatation. Okay, this is an uh, um, CT angiography showing an aneurysm. See, it is an outpouching of the artery. And being an outpouching, of course, it will start with a small size, but then because of the rush of blood, okay, the speed of blood flow, and this will keep increasing in size. And because the wall of the artery is very weak, and it can rupture anytime. Okay, aneurysm can be saccular or it can be fusiform. Okay, all right. In younger people, it's actually due to congenital uh, etiology, right? Yeah, people are born with it. But in older people, this is actually due to atherosclerosis because the wall of the artery becomes weak and therefore it's easy to cause outpouching of the arterial wall. Okay. And when the aneurysm ruptures, then you're going to end up having subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this is the one that causes severe headache. All right. The blood will now mix with the uh, CSF in the subarachnoid space. Now it will start occupying. See this, uh, the uh, hyper intense signal, right? It will now occupy the gyri, the, I mean the sulci, the basal cisterns, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see the blood occupying the subarachnoid space. Okay, all right. And then when you do lumbar puncture, okay, then um, uh, you're going to see consistency in the staining of the blood, right? From the first to the last tube, there's no change. It's really bloody, right? Or sometimes, okay, this is bloody because the rupture of the aneurysm is recent. But if it's, if the, the aneurysm bleeding has been going on for several days now, then it will turn the CSF into santochromic yellowish because the red blood cells are rupturing, right? They undergo hemolysis. Therefore, there will be escape of bilirubin, and therefore the uh, fluid will become yellow. Okay, this is a sample of an aneurysm shown on an angiogram. Okay, this is the worst headache of my life. Remember, a lot of times patients say, well, This is the worst headache of my life, doctor. And then they're crying, they're banging their head against the wall because it's so, 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 so severe, right? However, uh, be aware that patients will try to exaggerate. Okay, for all you know, it's just a plain headache. Okay, they bump their head against the cabinet and then they will say, oh, doctor, this is the worst headache of my life. Then if the patient tells you that, then you don't have a choice but to work up a patient as if he or she had subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay, and again, CT scan may help right away, right? You don't have to do lumbar puncture, but you're seeing blood already in the fissures and sulci as well as in the basal cistern, right? Okay, but okay, you may want to complement this by doing lumbar puncture, but then again, you're under the pressure of time, right? Okay, if you see this right away, you call the surgeon, okay, and start preparing the uh, radio radiology uh, or neuroradiology suite to do a, an angiogram so that you can inject the dye and locate the uh, uh, aneurysm that has ruptured, okay? All right, this is intracerebral or intraparenchymal hemorrhage, meaning there's bleeding within the brain tissue or brain parenchyma, all right? Most common cause of this is hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension. The blood pressure is too high. That's why the artery cannot uh, hold it anymore and it will 
rupture within the parenchyma, right? And the problem is, this is, you know, intracerebral or intraparenchymal hem parenchymal hemorrhage, uh, the progression is rapid, right? will start with maybe minor numbness on one side of the body, then, then, then it will become weak, and then the patient will become comatose in a matter of one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. Okay? So there's a rapid progression because the bleeding is, you know, keeps if the bleeding keeps on happening, then there will be accumulation of blood, and that's going to cause increase in size of the hemorrhage. And see, look here. It now compresses this portion of the brain, the right hemisphere, and then it, there's a midline shift already. Okay, it's crossing to the other side already. Okay, so the number one thing to do if you see this is normalize the blood pressure, right? Okay, because it is really the, the high blood pressure that makes the bleeding continue. So you really have to lower the blood pressure. Okay, now even uh, it's not just hemorrhage. You can actually, a headache can also happen if you have ischemic stroke, like ischemic infarct. See, there's no hemorrhage, but because of the ischemia, there will be massive cerebral edema or swelling. And therefore, see, it is compressing this part of the brain and there's a midline shift already. Okay, so this occurs if the ischemic infarct is too big because of the massive cerebral edema. Okay, remember the Monroe uh, doctrine, right? Uh, you know, the, the, the volume of the skull is fixed. So the contents will be the ones to adjust. And the very first thing to adjust is the CSF. All right, and then eventually the blood, and then eventually the tissue or the parenchyma itself. Okay, and then if the increase in the cranial pressure continues, then there will be herniation. Okay, intracranial hemorrhage again. Okay, for example, epidural hematoma or subdural hematoma. Okay, board exam question. Right. Okay, this actually came uh, out again uh, in this most recently concluded uh, um, FMGE. In India, okay, they showed epidural hematoma again. For some reason, it's really their favorite. In epidural hematoma, the hemorrhage is fish mouth or lens shape or biconvex, right? Biconvex. Whereas if it's subdural, it is moon shape or crescent shape. All right. And the, also the main difference is with epidural, this is due to rupture of the middle meningeal artery. Whereas this one, this is due to rupture of bridging veins. So here you have. Uh, oxygenated blood, and here you have unoxygenated blood. That's the reason why epidural hematoma is definitely much more life-threatening compared to subdural. In subdural, they may survive with the blood, okay, but if the bleeding continues, then, okay, that's when you start getting concerned. But with the epidural, by all means, you have to refer to the neurosurgeon so that they can determine if they need to do surgery right away, okay? It's urgent, definitely, all right? And uh, the classical uh, presentation here is they, there's history of trauma and there will, be, there will be laceration of the middle meningeal artery in the temporal area, right, on the side, okay, and the blood will accumulate. And the thing is, there is what you call lucid interval, okay, meaning that the patient may appear normal in the beginning. They bump their head, there's an accident, and then they stand up as if nothing happened. They just have a little headache. Oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm okay. And then four hours later, they drop dead. Okay, and that's because that's really the classical presentation of epidural hematoma. There is a lucid interval, meaning meaning there is an interval where they look like they're you know they're normal, nothing's going on, but bleeding is already accumulating. Right? With subdural, this is more common in older people, right? Our grandpa, grandma, they bump their head against the cabinet or against the door, whatever. And then they don't know that there's bleeding already. And because this is venous blood, then it's not necessarily fatal, right? But if it's a big amount of blood, then it may compress the brain. And therefore, that may cause a danger also. Okay? All right. Now, venous sinus thrombosis, meaning thrombosis of the venous sinuses or the veins of the brain, right? Okay? So, uh, you know, these are common in women. Okay, especially those women, please take note, okay, write down these notes. Uh, more common in women who birth, take birth control pills, right, or women who are pregnant, or women who are dehydrated, okay? If you are, if you are dehydrated, then the blood flow will be slow or slower, right? And pregnancy is a hyperviscous hyper state, right? Or if you have cancer, or if you are undergoing cancer chemotherapy, this will make your blood hyperviscous. So this, the flow of the blood will be slow. And therefore, 
the you will be prone to forming thrombosis in the venous sinuses okay like here you have the empty delta sign right okay that means that there's no blood flow in this area because there is obstruction or there's thrombosis okay and when you do uh, uh, mrv all right or uh, mr venogram okay you will see absence of a part of the venous system right here the transverse sinus is absent here and yet it's present here and then even the sigmoid sinus and then down to the internal jugular vein right but here there's nothing why because it is blocked that means that you do not see the vein because there is blockage the the contrast media was not able to pass through okay all right here you see the uh, there is clot formation in the superior sagittal sinus, right? In the uh, vertex or at the top of the uh, brain, okay? And here you will see um, cortical infarcts if it's in the midline, right? See, they are close to the midline because these are the venous infarcts. Okay, that means that there is obstruction of the uh, superior sagittal sinus, okay? All right, and again, how will you treat this? Of course, this is thrombosis. Therefore, you need to put these patients on heparin, anticoagulation, okay? Heparin, and then, of course, eventually warfarin or coumadin. Again, this is common in patients who are prone to hyperviscosity, okay? All right, brain abscess, okay? What's the trial of the brain abscess? Remember, number one, fever, because it's an infection. Number two, headache, because it increases intracranial pressure. And number three, focal neurological deficit, okay? Because it's a focal mass, it's a mass lesion, right? So here, for example, this lesion, this brain abscess is affecting the uh, basal nuclei, basal ganglia here. So the patient will probably show abnormal movements, right? And it's also affecting the uh, internal capsule here. And therefore, the patient may have hemiparesis, hemisensory loss, okay? And then the, the abscess is actually composed of a thick, very thick wall, so the purulent material or the pus inside will just collect there, right? Okay, and that's the reason why it's difficult to penetrate this with antibiotics. Okay, because a lot of times the, the wall of the abscess is so thick. And, uh, you know, the only solution is surgery. You have to refer these patients to the neurosurgeon, okay? And uh, the surgeon will have to remove the abscess, including the thick wall. If the surgeon just removes the pus or the purulent material after one week, it's back to, back to normal abscess again, meaning there's accumulation of pus again, right? So you really have to remove the thick wall of the abscess, okay? All right? And the most common location of the brain abscess is in the gray-white matter junction, right? Is the gray matter, cerebral cortex, and this is the white matter. So usually they are found in the gray-white matter junction because these bacteria, okay, are sent there through hematogenous spread, okay? And... Um, the um, we call this the this is usually polymicrobial, meaning it's not caused by just one microorganism or one bacterium. Usually, it's several bacteria. When you do a uh, culture of the pus, uh, send send it to the lab. Okay, it will grow out several microorganisms. Okay, all right, and then headache. Okay, may also be due to you know lumbar puncture. After doing lumbar puncture, basically you are decreasing the intracranial pressure. And that is going to cause intracranial hypotension. All right. And as a result, okay, that's the reason why you advise these patients after labor puncture, don't stand up for about four hours minimum. Okay. Just stay there, lie flat, don't move around. Okay. We'll just give you urinal. Okay. Don't go to the bathroom. All right. So they have to lie, lay flat. Okay. Because when you penetrate, okay, and insert the needle, you're actually creating a hole, right? Especially in the meninges of the spine. And the thing is, if they keep on moving, then that hole will not close off, all right? And therefore, there will be CSF leakage. The leakage you will not see, but the leakage will be inside, the subcutaneous tissue, et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay, so when you do uh, lumbar puncture, it's very important that you tell them to uh, lie flat for about minimum four hours, okay? And then, you know, if it happens again, you do a brain scan, you will see meningeal enhancement, right? If you do a contrast MRI or CT scan, right? You will see, you will see enhancement of the meninges, okay? As if they have meningitis, but actually this is due to hypotension. Okay, see, look at the increased signal intensity in the meningeal area, okay? The falx cerebri and the tentorium cerebelli, cerebelli. 
Okay? And if this happens, then you may give uh, pain medications, you may hydrate the patient, okay? And uh, you may give caffeine, all right? And if all this don't work, let's say the patient continues to cry because of severe headache, then you refer them to the either anesthesiologist or neuroradiologist so that they can do um, what we call uh, blood patch. Blood patch is they take a little, the little sample of their, the patient's blood and then patch it on the hole or the CSF leakage. And it will cause blockage because it's a blood. Okay, It will coagulate there and therefore it will seal off the CSF leakage. Okay, And the headache will go away. Okay. All right, hypertensive encephalopathy or posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. This occurs in patients with really high systolic blood pressure, 200, 220, 210. Okay, these patients will complain of headache, severe headache. And the headache is usually occipital. Okay, and at the same time, they will complain of blindness or blurred vision. That's because you will see ischemic changes in the occipital lobe or occipital area. Okay, now why, why the occipital? Because they say that the posterior circulation is very prone to uh, ischemia. Okay, the posterior circulation doesn't have a good compensatory um, autoregulatory mechanism, and therefore it's not able to uh, uh, adjust to the high blood pressure, and therefore it will become ischemic. All right. So the manifestations are severe headache and blurred vision because you, if you do an MRI, you will see ischemic changes in the occipital lobe. And how will you treat this patient? lower the blood pressure, okay? And you will see that the headache will start going away, okay? All right, that's why it's called reversible, okay? All right, temporal or giant cell arthritis, common in the elderly, all right? These patients usually are old already and they have anemia, they have joint pains, muscle aches, they have low grade fever, and then they're, they are tired all the time, fatigued, okay? And, uh, you know, when you look at them, you will see engorged superficial temporal artery, okay? And that's because it is inflamed, okay? And this is actually a cross-section of the artery. As you can see, the lumen or the cavity is decreased in size already, very small, right? And yet the wall is so heavily studded with inflammatory cells, okay? All right, so uh one thing that you can do uh, in fact when you touch this it's going to be very painful you don't want you to touch it right and then uh if you do a set rate okay you will see that it's really high normal set rate is only 0 to 20 right but with giant cell arthritis it's usually 60 80 100 110 120 very high okay and also crp if you do crp instead of esr also very high and uh the day this is considered urgent Okay, why? Because the problem here is that it's not just the temporal artery that is inflamed. Even the ophthalmic artery, even the other arteries, okay, adjacent to the temporal artery will also be inflamed. And therefore, the, if the ophthalmic artery is blocked, then the central retinal artery going to the retina will also be blocked. And therefore, it's going to be the retina will become ischemic and the patient will complain of blindness or blurred vision. And you need to do something about it by giving steroids, okay? How will you treat? Of course, you have to give prednisone, okay? Maybe you can start them at 60 to 80 milligrams per day for about two weeks, and then you start tapering down, okay? Some patients may have to require it for, for a longer time, okay? But the bottom line here is you suppress the inflammation by giving anti-inflammatories like steroids, okay? Now, definitive test is by doing uh, biopsy of the blood vessel, right? The temporal artery. But it's impractical because when you refer these patients to the surgeon, it takes a while before they get seen by the surgeon who's so busy. So by that time, your grandma is already blind, right? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to save eyesight of your grandma or your grandpa or whoever, right? So, um, you know, me, I just go ahead and treat them with steroids. Okay, all right. Brain tumor, obviously, will increase the intracranial pressure and that's going to cause headache, okay? And uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, otherwise known as pseudotumor cerebri, okay? As the term implies, pseudotumor, okay? Meaning that the patient behaves as if there's a brain tumor in terms of symptoms, and yet there's no brain tumor, right? There is a progressive headache, okay? They may have nausea, they may have vomiting, okay? And yet when you do brain scan, you do not see brain tumor, okay? What you may see is actually 
the ventricles are reduced to small size. See, look at the lateral ventricle. It is slit-like. And yet, you don't see midline shift, you don't see edema, you don't see any compression of structures because it's pseudotumor. There's really no tumor. Okay? And when you do uh, podoscopy, you will see papilledema. Again, a sign of increased intracranial pressure, and yet there's no tumor. Right? Okay. So, uh, what you can do for these patients is, the most benign is you give them acetazolamide, which will decrease the production of TSF. All right, but in my experience, that is not really effective. So you may do a series of lumbar puncture, let's say twice a month or once a month, they keep coming back to you and you do lumbar puncture. But then remember, a lot of times these are obese female, right? So it's very difficult to do lumbar puncture. So what you can do is by doing a ventricular peritoneal shunt. Okay, and that is the definitive treatment. Okay, all right. Uh, tic baloru or trigeminal neuralgia. Okay, this is like, like jabs or electrical jolts, like the face is being electrocuted, okay? And it's really painful. Let's say you're just quiet, trying to rest, and then suddenly you get jolt of pain, like ta -ta 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 -ta. and then you're like, oh my God, this, is, this really hurts. A lot of times, trigeminal neuralgia affects the B2 and B3 uh, branches of the uh, trigeminal nerve, okay? All right, and the treatment, you know, when you do a brain scan, you're not gonna see anything. And the treatment for this drug of choice is carbamazepine. Of course, nowadays, more and more anti-seizure medicines are effective for trigeminal neuralgia, like nabapentin, etc., oxcarbazepine, etc., etc. But the drug of choice for so long uh, is the carbamazepine, okay? and it really helps. Glossopharyngeal neuralgia, very similar to trigeminal neuralgia, but here, the pain is actually felt around the throat. Okay, so it's not really a head, well, it's considered a headache still because it's still part of the head, okay? So, you you know, you do a brain scan, you don't see anything, okay? And then treatment will be the same also, just like the trigeminal neuralgia, okay? You treat them with carbamazepine, gabapentin, all those seizure medications, okay? Post-herpetic neuralgia, after a bout of herpes zoster or shingles, now you will have crusting of the lesions and eventually just scars, right? and then they will go away. But then you may develop what we call post-herpetic neuralgia. Neuralgia means nerve pain. Post-herpetic meaning after herpes. All right? So after uh, having shingles, then you start having pain in the same area. And these are really severe stabbing pain, okay? And this time, it affects usually the V1 branch of the trigeminal nerve, okay? All right. And... Of course, just like trigeminal neuralgia, this may respond to gabapentin, all those seizure medicines, gabapentin, carbamazepine, or carbazepine, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, migraine, okay, one of the uh, overdiagnosed, in my opinion, okay, common in uh, women in reproductive age. That's why usually it starts in their uh, menses or in menstrual period or during menarche, all right? That's when the headache starts, right? The pathophysiology or pathogenesis of migraine is, okay, according to theories, there is a, um, a reduction in the blood flow in the occipital lobe, the occipital area. And that's the reason why migraines, usually you can feel them in the occipital area, the back of the head or on the side, right, unilateral. So the uh, reduction of blood flow will cause an alteration in the uh, uh, ionic flow across the membrane, cell membranes of neurons, right? So there will be disturbance in the um, electro electrolytes or ionic flow, right? And therefore, it will start spreading from the back towards the anterior aspect, right? Okay, and then at the same time, there will be inflammation of the meninges. Now, this is a sterile inflammation, meaning there are no microorganisms involved, but the uh, meninges are swollen, inflamed, right? And because they are inflamed, then they may cause compression of the blood vessels, and that will lead to reduction of the blood, blood flow. And then that will send a signal to the trigeminal ganglion, okay, to the nucleus caudalis, and the periacudal gray matter, okay, all the way to the thalamus, and then eventually to the primary sensory cortex. And that's when they have you have a full-blown migraine. And remember that they are more common in... Uh, you know, women of reproductive age, okay, because they think it's related to the hormones. Uh, there's family history, a lot of times, not all the time, okay, but men can get it too, all right? Usually, they are severe stabbing or sharp pain, usually unilateral, okay, only one side or occipital in the back, 
and then it is pounding or uh, throbbing or pulsating like a heartbeat. All right, and then they get nauseous, they vomit, and then they get photophobia or phonophobia. They are sensitive to light and noise, so they would rather stay in a dark, quiet room. All right, now there are two types of migraines. One is um, uh, migraine with aura. The other one is migraine without aura. The one with aura is otherwise known as com, you know, um, classical migraine, whereas the one without aura is the common migraine. And the aura that we're talking about here is before they get the symptoms uh, of the headache, before they get the headache, they get a, you know warning signs, like usually visual because it's in the occipital, right? So they see stars, light flashes, dark spots, zigzag lines, colors, whatever, or you know distortion of the image whatever, but it can be any type of warning sign, kind of similar to the aura of seizures, right? But here with migraine, usually it's visual. It could be, uh, you know, central scotoma or whatever. And then they eventually get to the headache phase, and that's when they get the severe headache, okay? The one with the, the common migraine without the aura, they just get the headache right away. Of course, probably it's better to have the, if you were going to choose, it's probably better to choose the one without well, with aura, so at least you can prepare that, uh-oh, okay, I'm seeing stars. I think it means that I'm going to get a bad headache. So I'm going to take my medication. Okay, So it prepares you. All right? Okay. Now, of course, the pain usually affects the, uh, you know, hemicranial, meaning half of the head. Okay, unilateral, but it can also be bilateral. It can be the entire head. Okay, but usually unilateral. Okay, and... It has uh, a familial tendency, okay, genetic uh, predisposition. These are the genes that were identified to be related to migraines, okay? And look, looking at an object, a person, you may see distortion like this, right? Shimmering zigzag lines. And when you try to read, you may see, you know, uh, disappearance of the letters or the text that you're looking at or you're trying to read. And then it may eventually do this and increase in size. Okay, so there's a lot of things that can happen. This is just an example. Okay, and then migraine is episodic or paroxysmal or intermittent. Okay, now there are two ways of treating migraine, right? One is by taking an abortive medicine, something that you take when you get a headache. Okay, you may get an effective medicine, but it's not going to prevent the headache from coming back. That's why patients will have to take the prophylactic or preventive medication. Okay, so these are some of the abortive medicines, NSAIDs, okay, triptans are the most specific ones, okay, ergot, alkaloids, ergotamines, all right? These are the abortive medications. But if the headaches are frequent, then are you going to take medicines every time you get a headache, right? So you want to make them go away, right? So that's why you need to take a prophylactic or preventive medicine. If let's say, for example, you get four bad headaches a week, that's a lot already. Right, that's going to make you lose. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, you cannot go to work. It will affect your lifestyle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You would rather stay in your bedroom, and you, you know, the awful feeling of not being able to eat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so you can take prophylactic medications, which your neurologist will prescribe to you. All right, the most common ones used are the beta blockers like propranolol. Okay, the anti-epileptic drugs like the valproic acid or topiramate, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, all right. Now, uh, of course, with pregnancy, okay, a lot of times you cannot really prescribe specific migraine medicines, right? But usually for abortive treatment, we give paracetamol or meperidine for the nausea and vomiting and then somatriptan. Okay, now cluster headache, again, it's not that common, but it can happen. I've seen it only twice. Uh, this time it's more common in men, uh, middle-aged, all right? And for some reason, they are more common in businessmen. I don't know why, okay? But, okay, they actually, uh, in the middle, they usually, they this is precipitated by drinking alcohol, okay, with dinner or before they go to bed, okay? And, uh, you know, in the middle of the night, they wake up with some severe stabbing pain, usually periorbital. And the periorbital pain is associated with sympathetic symptoms, okay? Right? Sympathetic, uh, you know, uh, signs. For example, you have a little ptosis, okay, you have conjunctival injection, the uh, eye is a little red, and then there will be increased lacrimation or tearing, okay, and uh, you know, um, the, the drug of choice for this one actually is 
uh, oxygen. All right. So when patients go to the ER or they are brought to the ER and then they, they are given oxygen, within 15 minutes, the headache goes away. So the oxygen is very uh, helpful. Some of the specific migraine medicines may also help, like tumatriptan, etc., etc. Now, because this is kind of predictable, you can tell what time of the year you get uh, cluster headaches. Then what these businessmen do is they buy their own oxygen tank and they keep it in their bedroom so that when they get um, uh, an attack of cluster headache, then they can just do the oxygen and give it to themselves. Okay. All right. Tension headache is something that is not as severe. And it's not really sharp. It's, it's felt like uh, pressure around the head. Okay, It is all over or bilateral. Okay, Patients describe this as their head is being compressed by a vice grip, being compressed or squeezed. Okay, It's not throbbing. It doesn't pulsate. It doesn't make, it doesn't make them uh, um, uh, nauseous or they don't vomit. Okay, But it's there. It's constant. Okay? And um, usually this is related to spasms of the muscles of the scalp, the forehead, and the neck. Okay, so what may help here is the anti-inflammatories or the muscle relaxers. Okay, all right. And of course, cervicogenic headache, if you have a lot of, you know, they say degenerative changes of the spine, like arthritis, quote unquote, of the spine, then you may get a lot of headaches around the neck, in the shoulders, and in the occipital area. Okay, treatment, massage therapy. Oh, by the way, just like tension headache, right? Massage therapy, relaxation of the muscles, okay, may help. All right, sinus headache, something that is also overdiagnosed just because you have uh, uh, a little bit of uh, nasal discharge, a little bit of nasal stuffiness, and right away you're diagnosed as sinus headache. But sinus headache, strictly speaking, there is sinusitis, there's inflammation of the sinuses. For example, here. Look at this sinus. It's empty, right? Remember, sinuses are not supposed, supposed to contain anything except uh, air, right? But the problem here is that uh, there is accumulation of pus or purulent material or, you know, the infection here. Okay, and this will clog the sinuses and therefore it will start causing pressure here. And therefore, it's felt as a pressure around the nasal bridge depending on the what sinuses um Clog, right? The frontal sinus, maxillary sinus, or the um, ethmoid sinus, or the um, sphenoid sinus. Okay, uh, sphenoid sinus is felt in the nasal area. Eth uh, sorry, that's ethmoid sinus. Sphenoid sinus is felt at the top of the head. Frontal sinus in the forehead. Maxillary sinus is in the cheekbone. Right? Okay. All right. And uh, see, look at this. You have bacteria accumulation of bacteria and infection plus mucus inside the sinuses. Okay, see, look here. You have a pus inside. Okay, and it will block the drainage of the sinuses. Here, look, here, the left side seems to be fine, all aerated well, but here you don't see air anymore and it's clogged with pus or purulent material. Okay, and you have to treat this just like how you treat infection, right? Okay, you have to give antibiotics, but if it doesn't help, then you refer them to the ENT so they can drain the sinus or the inflamed sinus. Okay, all right. Headache due to dental disease. For example, you know, if you have a uh, um, dental problem or you have temporomandibular joint dysfunction, right? The joint between the temporal bone okay, and the mandible, the condyle. Okay, then it will cause a lot of headache, especially on the side of your head, right? Okay, so you refer them to the ENT or you may just prescribe, uh, you know, pain medications, whatever works. Okay, headache good to carry malformation, right? Remember, carry malformation, the genital disease or malformation of the brain, there's type 1 and type 2. Type 1, there's actually herniation, downward herniation of the cerebellar tonsil, right? Remember, this is the area of the foramen magnum. All right, so there is herniation downward of the... Um, cerebellar tonsil, okay? Sometimes what happens is that there's actually herniation already of some parts of the medulla, right? Remember, the foramen magnum, okay, it should be only the uh, spinal cord that goes down, right? And this is actually type 2 already. Type 1, you just have herniation of the cerebellar tonsil, okay? Here, you see, this is after autopsy, you see the markings made by the foramen magnum. That's a bone, right? Okay. Now here, in type 2, there's actually herniation 
uh, or beyond the foramen magnum. And at the same time, there's an associated syringomyelia or syrinx, the cavity in the spinal cord. Okay? This is type 2 already, which is obviously worse. Now, this, both types may cause headache, but then the type 2 is worse. Okay, if it's only type 1, you just monitor by doing a repeat MRI or CT scan after one month, after two months, after three months, whatever. If there's no progression and you examine the patient, the patient seems to be doing okay, then there's no need to do surgery. But, okay, if there is neurological deterioration or it's a type 2 uh, Arnold Carey malformation, then you may do decompress. Okay, all right. That's it for the headache part. Now let's go to the uh, neuroinfections. The neuroinfections are too many. So we will just, I will just mention things that you need to uh, learn. Okay. Now, neuroinfections, of course, you are thinking of bacterial infections viral infections, um, fungal infections, and then parasitic infestations or infections also, okay? All right. Now, when you say bacterial meningitis, uh, well, first of all, when you say meningitis, it means inflammation of the meninges, but the most common cause is infection, right? And... Uh, yeah, it's actually the leptomeninges that are affected really, not the dura matter, but the arachnoid and the pia matter because they are thin and delicate. The dura is so thick and fibrous, that's why it's a little bit difficult for the microorganisms to penetrate them. But eventually, as time goes on, eventually even the dura matter will get affected. Okay, and of course, because the meninges discovers the brain, then there will be extension of the infection into the brain, brain parenchyma, and now you're going to end up having meningoencephalitis. Okay, all right. And uh, some of the most common causes of uh, bacterial meningitis okay, are these, okay, except focus pneumonia. Usually, there is uh, an underlying pneumonia, otitis media, sinusitis, mastoiditis, basilar skull fracture, all these infections somewhere, and then the infection was just uh, sp or just spreads or extends into the meninges. Okay, Neisseria meningitidis. Okay, meningococcal meningitis. This is common in crowded areas or college dormitories. Okay, or uh, military camps because there is crowding. It's very easy to transmit the Neisseria meningitidis microorganisms. Right. Okay, and then Listeria monocytogenes. This is actually uh, oral route, right? Okay, this is more common in neonates and those who are immunosuppressed, like transplant patients, okay? And, uh, you know, chronic liver disease, diabetes, etc., etc. all the immunosuppressive uh, state. Okay, now, uh, meningitis can also be predicted based on the age group, right? In neonates or newborn, okay, uh, some of the most common ones are actually the E. coli, right? Because of the, uh, you know, when the baby is being delivered, the vaginal uh, vault, the vaginal canal is just next to the anal uh, anus, right? And therefore, the E. coli is part of the normal flora of the gut. And therefore, it's very easy for the microorganism to get, uh, I mean, to be transmitted to the baby because, again, during uh, birth, all right, then the baby can get infected, okay? Now, also another common uh, microorganism is group B strep or Streptococcus agalactiae. Another one is Listeria. Okay, in older, the adults, like adult or older, elderly, all right, the most common is uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae, okay, and Staph aureus. Staph aureus is also common after a neurosurgical procedure, like, for example, uh, you know, ventriculoperitoneal shunt placement or head trauma, okay. All right, so, you know, just based on age group, you can predict. So at least you can do empirical antibiotic therapy because it's an infant. Okay, what are the most common causes of uh, uh, meningitis in newborns, infants? Okay, so you can predict. Okay, and uh, this is an example of, uh, you know, a frank acute bacterial meningitis. You see the pus occupying pretty much the, uh, the fissures in the sulci of the brain and even the surface of the brain. Okay, all right. This is basilar meningitis, meaning the base of base of the uh, 
the skull, okay? The base of the brain is the one that's infected. Therefore, it will cause involvement of the cerebellum, the brain stem, and even the cranial nerves. So if you see meningitis and you see multiple cranial nerve abnormalities, okay, then, or cerebellar uh, manifestations, then think about basilar meningitis, okay? And what are some of the uh, microorganisms that love affecting the base of the brain? Number one is TB, tuberculosis, okay? Okay, that's why TB meningitis usually presents okay, with multiple cranial nerve abnormalities. Okay, another one is the uh, Lyme disease in other countries. Okay, all right, so you may see facial asymmetry because the facial nerve is affected. Okay, all right, and as you can see here, look at this sulcus or fissure. It is occupied by pus with all these inflammatory cells. Okay, and the most common symptom, remember, what's a trido meningitis? Headache. Next, F stiffness or neck rigidity, and then fever. That's a triad of meningitis. Triad of brain abscess is headache, uh, fever, and focal neurological deficit. Okay, all right. So, um, you know, uh, when you have a patient with uh, possible meningitis, of course, you're going to do the Kernig sign and Brzezinski sign. You know already how to elicit them, right? Okay. And, uh, you know, of course, they're not always present. They are specific for meningitis, but they are not that sensitive. That's why meningitis doesn't always present with Brzezinski sign and Kernig sign, but they may, all right? And, um, you know, the, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, one of the most fatal and most dangerous type of meningitis is actually the meningococcal meningitis due to Neisseria meningitis, okay? It's highly fatal. If you see a patient suspecting suspected of meningitis, and then you see uh PTK, all right, then start thinking about uh, meningococcal meningitis, which is highly infectious, so you have to isolate the patient, okay? All right, because this is another manifestation of Neisseria meningitis. Patients will start having PTK or pinpoint hemorrhages, then eventually they will turn into purpura, okay, in a matter of one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, okay? It is widespread now. You have meningococcemia because it is now causing sepsis. Okay, and when you do lumbar puncture, you will see a cloudy or turbid CSF. All right. Of course, there will be neutrophilia or pleocytosis with neutrophilic predominance. Then will, there will be elevated protein, decreased glucose because the glucose is being used by the bacteria and the neutrophils or WBCs. Okay. And uh, of course, when you do gram stain, you may see gram negative diplococci, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then you wait for the culture. Of course, uh, if you can do the lumbar puncture quickly, you can actually do an empirical antibiotic therapy. You don't wait for the result, right? But ideally, you have to do the, uh, you have to give the antibiotics only after you do the lumbar puncture because if you give it before and then you do the lumbar puncture later, then it will be negative because you have given. Uh, antibiotics already, okay? But make sure you do it quickly. But if you cannot, okay, then you cannot wait, all right? You have to give antibiotic therapy right away, okay? And then, you know, the problem, another complication of Neisseria meningitis is, remember, there will be, what do you call this complication? Adrenal hemorrhage. What is that syndrome? Anyone? Ah, maybe I should ask that question, okay? In a serum meningitis, there will be adrenal hemorrhage. waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome, okay? waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome. There will be bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and hemorrhage. Now, the patient's blood pressure will start dropping and the patient may die. So you have to give intravenous fluids, all right? And then treat the patient with appropriate treatment, okay? Antibiotics. All right, so these are some of the um, causes in different age groups, the neonate, child, okay, these are the etiologic agents, and then these are the antibiotics of choice, okay? All right, now, there is what you call aseptic meningitis. When you say aseptic meningitis, it just means that it's non-bacterial. So it could be viral, it could be fungal, it could be parasitic, it could also be chemical meningitis. As you know, certain drugs or medications can cause meningitis, and yet there's no microorganism, okay? That's what's called chemical meningitis, all right? Overall, it's aseptic meningitis, meaning it's non-bacterial, all right? And when you do uh, lumbar puncture, 
A lot of times, the fluid is actually clear, okay? It's not cloudy, all right? And then it's predominantly lymphocytes, okay? Non-neutrophilic. And then when the proteins will be slightly elevated only, not as bad compared to the bacterial, okay? And the glucose will be normal or just a slightly low, okay? Unlike bacteria where it's really low because the glucose is being utilized by the bacteria and the neutrophils, okay? All right, and by the way, with, uh, with Neisseria meningitis, the highly fatal, okay, once you see the purpuric lesions, then you have to prescribe prophylaxis to the nursing staff who got exposed and to the household contacts of the patient. And what uh, drug are you going to give? Rifampicin. Okay, rifampin, the one that will turn the urine yellow or orange, okay? You have to prescribe it to the, those who got exposed to the patient with Neisseria meningitis. Okay, and of course, you know, if the increased nuclear pressure will continue to happen, then there might be herniation. That's why we're trying to prevent this. Okay, and we can give steroids, right, to decrease the uh, edema and the inflammation. Okay. Treat the septic shock, all right, treat the seizures, all right. Of course, antibiotic, treat the metabolic derangement because that's going to alter the electrolyte, sodium, potassium, etc., etc. Of course, the best thing for all is you vaccinate the children, the infants, okay? For example, the H influenza type B vaccine is very effective. This dramatically reduced the incidence and prevalence of H influenza meningitis, okay, because of the vaccination. All right, brain abscess, we already talked about it, right? Okay. By the way, with, with brain abscess, the definitive treatment is surgery, right? You remove the abscess with the thick wall. But before you do that, you have to give IV antibiotics so that, okay, there is a circulating antibiotic already. Because the problem sometimes is when you, okay, do the surgery, you accidentally uh, spread the infection, the pus, and it will be carried by the blood throughout the body. And now the, end, the patient ends up having septic shock disease. So before you do the surgery, you have to load the patient with intravenous antibiotic. Okay. Subdural empyema, basically the same as uh, meningitis. Okay. So subdural empyema, instead of having uh, blood in the subdural, uh, you know, the crescent shape, the um, collection, there's actually pus instead of blood. Okay, but basically it's the same. Epidural abscess, okay, kind of similar to uh, epidural hematoma, or it can happen in the spine, right? You have collection of pus, all right? And that can be drained surgically, and you treat the patient with antibiotics. Now, sometimes... Meningitis can be chronic and recurrent, especially if the anti antibiotic therapy is not enough. Let's say instead of giving it for 10 days, you give it only for five days, six days. So now you think the patient is treated, but the infection was only suppressed for a while, but then it can become chronic and recurrent. Okay. Patients, for example, with basilar skull fracture, right? There is a tear in the meninges. So there is a consistent or constant CSF leak, and that's a portal of entry for the bacteria. Okay. And then um, PB, meningitis, like I said, it will cause granulomatous uh, or granuloma formation, right? Okay. So if you do an AFB stain, then you will see this slender bacilli. Okay. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, acid fast. And then remember that. Uh, TB, patients with TB, they have a very typical uh, appearance, right? They are very thin, they look cachectic, all right? They are malnourished, and then they have night sweats, they have night fever, all right? They lose their appetite, they lose weight. Sometimes you even think they have cancer, but, okay, they also have fever, all right? And they have neck stiffness. And a lot of times, before you can get TB meningitis, it will start uh, causing disease in the lungs first. So you will have TB of the lungs. But then, because this is chronic infection, and you know, let's face it, a lot of those who live in the crowded areas, like, like quarters areas, they don't see doctors. So now the infection spreads to the blood, 
hematogen at it spreads to the brain hematogenously and therefore they end up having TB meningitis. All right, so it likes affecting the base of the brain, so they will present with multiple cranial nerve abnormalities. Okay, like facial asymmetry, facial paralysis. There may be um, extraocular movement uh, abnormalities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or numbness to the face. Okay. Okay, this is just uh, a sample of the granuloma, right? Okay, with involvement of the blood vessels. The problem is the blood vessels may get actually compressed, and therefore, patients may end up getting a stroke. Okay. Treatment is, of course, the RIPE, RIPE, rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, ethambutol. The RIP, rest in peace, RIP, all of them are hepatotoxic. All right, so you need to monitor the liver function of the patient, ASD, ALD. The E, ethambutol, does not really, it's not really um, hepatotoxic, but it can cause optic neuropathy. So the patient will have uh, you know, visual problems. So you have to monitor these things when you put these patients on the RIPE treatment. Okay. All right. Now, the spine, the POTS disease can get affected, right? POTS disease or even the spine. So there will be fracture. And, uh, you know, look at this uh, guy. This is an adult male patient and look at the body, right? It's all curved because they have developed kyphosis because of the fracture. Okay. And treatment is the same, RIPE. And a lot of times, patients have pulmonary tuberculosis first, but then it's spread to involve the spine or the brain. Okay, neurosyphilis, right? Spirochete, spiral microorganism, all right? Treponema pallidum, all right? Remember, when you get syphilis, you have the primary, secondary, and then tertiary stage, right? Primary is genital. So due to uh, sexual activity with someone infected with uh, syphilis, you will have the discharge and then you will have the painless ulcer. And because it's painless, you may see an ulcer, but you're like, oh, maybe because my underwear is too tight. Uh, maybe because I scratch my uh, private parts uh, too much. Okay, So you don't go to the doctor, but the reality is that's actually... Um, painless ulcer already from neurosyphilis or from syphilis okay now it will proceed the bacteria will spread okay and now it will proceed to the mucocutaneous meaning okay mucous membranes of the oral cavity okay or um, in the skin right so patients this is the secondary stage now right patients will have these things okay a lot of the rash Et cetera, et cetera. And again, they think this is ah, it's something. Maybe I, you know, I maybe I'm just allergic to the dust or whatever. And they don't see the doctor again, right? And then it will proceed to the tertiary. Tertiary is now okay. Involvement of the usually the nervous system and the cardiovascular system. You may have aortic dissection, okay, in the uh, you know, and then the heart is is involved, or it will start affecting the nervous system. You have, you will have the meningitis. You will have the um, Neurosyphilis, the tabis dorsalis. Do you remember tabis dorsalis of the spinal cord, right? It affects the dorsal column. That's why you call it tabis dorsalis. Please mute your microphone, whoever you are. Okay, I'm getting distracted. I think it's the same Kapadia. Please mute your microphone. Okay, all right. So, uh, you know, with tertiary syphilis, now you have involvement of the nervous system. That's why you call it neurosyphilis, okay? So you will end up uh, having involvement of the all parts of the nervous system. The brain, it will cause dementia. Even though the infection happened 20 years ago, the treponema pallidum will survive, right? Will it survive in your body, all right? So you will, it will cause dementia, okay, when it comes to the brain or stroke, right? Because of compression of the blood vessels. It may cause involvement of the spinal cord, and that's what you call tibis dorsalis or tabis dorsalis. There will be the generation of the dorsal column. So now you cannot walk, right? Because your proprioception and vibration sense are are involved. Okay, and then it may affect the peripheral nerves. Okay, and you will have peripheral neuropathy. So you will keep on falling, and then you have numbness in the feet or in the legs or sometimes in the hands. Okay. Dorsalis, okay, and even eventually you will become, uh, you will have general paresis, and this is called dementia paralytica. 
All right? You are just paralyzed, okay, in your extremities, and at the same time, you have dementia already. Okay? See, look at this. The artery is so inflamed, okay, that's why the lumen or the cavity is reduced to a small size. You're going to end up having a stroke. This is the tabis dorsalis with involvement of the dorsal column. Okay, impaired vibration and proprioception. Okay, so how will you diagnose neurosyphilis? By doing lumbar puncture. You will uh, send the CSF for VDRL. CSF VDRL, okay? And then treatment is you will give benzatine penicillin injection, okay? Or sometimes you may do oral do doxycycline, but, you know... Uh, with me, okay, with my experience with patients, uh, it's better to give the intramuscular injection, benzatine penicillin. But of course, if you're depressed, is allergic to that, then you don't have a choice but to give oral doxycycline. Even if it's late and syphilis, long time ago, many years ago, it can still kill the treponema pallidum. Okay? Now, leptospirosis is something that you get from uh, urine, right? urine of rats or whatever during flood dead during rainy season or there's flood that's why it's not a good idea for you to uh you know uh put your feet in flooded areas right okay it's especially children they play with the uh, floods okay that's not good because they might get infected with the bacteria of leptospirosis leptospira interrogans okay and they are also spirochetes to this all right now because you get infected, okay, either in, you know, um, uh, contamination of the food, the water, or you yourself, you get exposed, you have a wound, right? And it will start entering your body and start affecting your liver, all right? You will have fulminant uh, liver failure and you may die from it. I have a friend who died from that, okay? And, well, actually, sorry, let me take them back. Uh, a friend who died from something else, but he actually had leptospirosis, okay? And you may give intravenous penicillin G or doxycycline again. Okay, Lyme disease, something that's present in certain countries only, right? But for those of you who are going to take the USMLE and you may or you may end up practicing in the US or Europe or wherever, okay, where you have Lyme disease, this is a favorite question in the USMLE, okay? Neuroborreliosis, Lyme disease, something that a lot of times are misdiagnosed and then, you know, it becomes chronic and therefore, Okay, uh, sometimes it's too late already. And this is actually due to bite of a tick, a tick bite. All right, for those of you who like going to jungles or forests or mountain hiking, whatever, okay, you may be bitten by a tick. Okay, the tick is called Ixodes. Okay, it belongs to the Ixodes family. And then the organism is the Borrelia burgdorferi. Okay, what happens is when you get bitten by a tick, Okay, let's say here in your arm, a lot of times you don't see it, okay? Unless you examine your body in the mirror, a full body mirror, then you will see the classical, okay, uh, rash, which is, what do you call this rash? Chronicum erythema migrans, okay, erythema migrans. This is the alternating redness, erythema, and then normal skin, and then redness again, and the normal skin. Okay, you see... Uh, concentric layers of normal and erythematous uh, skin. Okay, this is where you have the tick bite. Okay, sometimes, a lot of times, we, you know, people get bitten in the back, so they don't see it, right? They take a shower, et cetera, et cetera, and they don't notice it. Okay, it's very important if you are going to do mountain hiking or, uh, you know, you're going to go to the forest, whatever, you have to um, examine your body when you take a shower because if you see this erythema chronicum migrans, then you need to get treated with antibiotics, okay? Because sometimes it will now cause, it, if, if it spreads, then it will now cause uh, meningitis and then with multiple cranial nerve abnormalities. And like I said, it likes affecting the base of the brain. So you, have, you will have multiple cranial nerve abnormalities. Like here, facial paralysis, okay? And... Um, you may do, uh, you know, do lumbar puncture or blood, send it for the uh, serology testing like ELISA, okay, immunofluorescence, CSF antibody, all right? And then you treat, okay, the patient with doxycycline or amoxicillin. See, it's just a simple uh, oral antibiotics. But if you miss it, you can die eventually. It's a chronic infection, okay? Leprosy. 
Okay, Mycobacterium leprae. Okay, this is something that is not highly infectious. You can only get leprosy if you have constant exposure to some of the leprosy. Although this is considered to be uh, controlled already. There are only certain parts of the world. Okay, in the Philippines, we used to have a lot of people with leprosy. In fact, there was a special hospital dedicated, dedicated to leprosy only. But now, they have converted the hospital into a regular hospital because not, not a lot of people are have leprosy. Okay, this is something that has been controlled worldwide okay but what happens here here is that you will end up having disfigurement of usually the cold areas the fingers the the, the ears the nose okay and then here you even have the leonin or lionin facies the face looks like lion okay and then you have uh, you know disfigurement of the uh, the uh, the fingers and the toes okay the arms and the legs and this is mycobacterium leprae, so it's kind of similar to mycobacterium tuberculosis, right? And this is treated with clofazimin, okay, or dapsone. Okay, tetanus, you know already, these are infectious toxins, right? It's the toxin that is causing the problem, okay? Tetanus, if you get uh, wounded, right, that's why you need to go to the ER to get a shot, okay? Tetanus toxoid and the uh, immunoglobulin. All right, and the tetanus uh, bacteria look like this. All right. And, you know, as you know, tetanus will cause rhesus sardonicus or locked jaw, right? Okay, they look like, you know, they are smiling, but actually it's because of the contraction of the facial muscle. Okay, rhesus sardonicus or grimacing. Okay, and it may be difficult for them to open their jaw. That's a locked jaw, Christmas, that they're talking about. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, diphtheria, you already know, okay, this is more common in children, right? There is the characteristic pseudomembrane, look at this, the gray pseudomembrane that occurs. Oh, by the way, I have to log off, hold on a second, log off and log in again. Okay, hold on. Okay, you know, when you, when you have diphtheria, you know, remember children, this is the barking cough, right? They keep on coughing and coughing and coughing. That's because of the toxin coming from the Corinibacterium diphtheriae, okay? And it produces this classical pseudomembrane that is grayish, see? When you ask the patient to open his mouth, say aloud, ah, and then you will see the pseudomembrane that you can scrape off, okay? But they say do not touch it, okay, because it might spread the... Uh, the toxins even more. Okay. Um, botulism. By the way, with the um, diphtheria, you can give the IM or intramuscular penicillin again. Okay. 
Now, botulism, again, this is because of the Botox, right? The botulinum toxin, the most powerful biological toxin of all. All right. You guys can still hear me? Yes, no. Okay. All right. Yes, and uh, Clostridium botulinum is the organism, right? And the problem here is that the toxins will now bind to the receptors. And then they will, you know, uh, the problem is you will end up having muscular weakness. And the weakness here is um, ascending also, kind of similar to uh, to uh, Guillain-Barre or Guillain-Barre syndrome, right? Ascending paralysis, right? And then eventually you will end up having involvement of the respiratory muscles and then the muscles of the larynx, pharynx, the muscles of the face, the cranial nerves. Okay, and you know there are several ways of getting the toxin. One is you can get them from preserved uh, food. Okay, the toxin is there, and then when you eat it, you get the toxin. Okay, or sometimes you can get it also by, uh, you know, in infants that uh, are given uh, raw honey. Okay, the honey has the toxin, right? And then uh, of course by intravenous, the, using intravenous drugs, if you use infected needles, then you can get uh, uh, the toxin also, right? And one way of, of determining, because a lot of times they will present with muscle weakness, right? Which is ascending. Eventually, even the breathing muscles will get affected and then they will become unconscious. They are intubated or uh, connected to the respirator, right? So sometimes you don't know, okay, is, what, what kind of muscle weakness is this? Is this myasthenia gravis? Because it can present the same way, right? Or is it beyond barre Or is it botulism? All right. One way of determining is by uh, with botulism, you start, you check the pupils. Okay. Remember, myasthenia gravis is a pure neuromuscular junction disease, right? It's not gonna cause auto autonomic symptoms or signs. So therefore, if the pupils are slow or sluggish or they do not react to light, then that cannot be myasthenia then you know that's what you live in. Okay? All right. And then, of course, you know, you may see wounds, infected wounds, right? Because that can be a portal of entry for the toxin and for the bacteria, right? Okay, so you have to treat this patient in the ICU, okay? And then, uh, you know, you have to call the Department of Health for the antitoxin. But then, this is something that should be done quickly, all right? You don't want to waste time because once it's too late, then the toxins have bound to the receptors already and it's too late, okay? So uh, you just have to be quick when you do this, when you give the antitoxin, all right? In terms of viral infections, okay, we already talked about aseptic meningitis, viral meningitis. One thing that in terms of viruses, you need to know about the, oh, well, of course, you already know the herpes virus, the shingles, right? Herpes zoster, okay? It follows a dermatomal pattern. Okay, and you have to give a cyclovir. The uh, one thing that I want you to study is the acute viral encephalitis. This is actually usually caused by herpes simplex virus, right? Okay, and the classical manifestation of this is usually it's an old patient. I'm saying usually because it can happen even to children also, but usually it's an old, our elderly, grandpas, grandmas, okay? And then, probably because they are immunocompromised because of their advanced age, okay? And then they have a uh, high fever, like up to 40s, 41, okay? And then they may complain of headache, and then they are confused. They have encep encephalopathy. They are confused, okay? And then at the same time, they may have seizures, all right? These are the classical presentation of uh, herpes simplex virus encephalitis. They have very high fever, they have a headache and they have altered mental status or confusion and then seizures. Okay, sometimes they even become comatose. Okay, and when you um, um, because they get seizures and when you do an EEG, you will see okay uh, periodic lateralizing epileptic charges, meaning that it affects only a, um, how do you say it? A uh, it's a partial seizure. Okay meaning it, you see epileptiform discharges only on one side of the brain, only one cerebral hemisphere. You can see here, only one side, and yet here, it seems to be normal. Okay? And then, at the same time, when you do lumbar puncture, you will see, okay, uh, hemorrhage or blood stain. So you might think, aha, this is a hemorrhage. But really, this is due to the hemorrhage 
caused by the herpes simplex virus. Okay, as you can see here, there is hemorrhage already. And it has a favorite lobe of the brain, the temporal lobe. Please take note, temporal lobe. And that's the reason probably why they get seizures, right? Remember the temporal lobe? Okay, it's a favorite of seizures. Okay, so when you do an MRI, you will see, okay, this signal intensity affecting the temporal lobe. Temporal lobe, temporal lobe, temporal lobe, temporal lobe. It may be unilateral only, but then it can spread to the other side, and therefore you have bilateral. Okay, so what do you need to remember about herpes simplex virus encephalopathy? Okay, number one, it can affect usually older people. I'm saying usually because it can happen in younger people also. Usually they have a very high fever, 40, 41. They are confused, they have altered mental status, they have headaches, and then they have seizures. Okay, and when you do a lumbar puncture, you will see lymphocytosis or lymphocytic predominance, lymphocytic pleocytosis, and then increased red blood cell count because there's hemorrhage. And in terms of preferential involvement, usually it's a temporal lobe. Okay, so those are the things that you need to remember. And of course, treatment is a cyclovir, but it requires early diagnosis, right? Early recognition. If you are too late, then your patient will die. And the problem here is that uh, a lot of times patients are left with a residual neurological deficit. For example, once the infection is over, your grandpa or grandma may be left with some kind of behavioral problem, okay, or seizures. Okay, there's a residual. Okay, but the infection is over. Okay, that's why early recognition is very important. So you can treat right away. The cyclovir is treatment. Okay, so that's the only thing I want you to remember about viral. How about, okay, rabies, you know already when you get uh, bitten by a rabid animal, okay, here in the Philippines and developing countries, usually it's the dog, right? Because they do not vaccinate the dogs, their pets. But in developed countries, usually they get it from wild animals like skunks, okay, raccoons, bats, whatever. But when you get bitten, the first thing you need to do is uh, wash it with running water and then soap, no matter how painful it is, but you have to do it, okay, to remove the uh, virus at the area of the wound, okay, because eventually it will cause encephalitic rabies or paralytic rabies. Paralytic rabies, you're paralyzed, you're weak, you're dumb, in other words. That's why they call it dumb paralysis, okay? The encephalitic rabies is the furious type where the patient is like, you know, acting as if it's a wild uh, it's a wild dog barking, okay? And you have to tie them down to the bed, otherwise they will bite you, okay? And, you know, it can be transferred by saliva. Usually they have hydrophobia and aerophobia, all right? They, are, they have fear of water and um, air. Okay, so you don't want to direct the electric fan to them or you don't want them to get wet with water because they will just become crazy. All right? And a lot of times it is fatal. Okay? Even if you, once it has reached, the virus has reached the brain, then, you know, chances are they will die. Okay? There's a very small likelihood of the patient surviving, but chances are they will die. Okay? And... Um, That's why, by the way, that's why when you get bitten by a dog, okay, that is rabid, you have to get the vaccination, okay? Okay, now how about fungal polio? You know already, in poliomyelitis, it affects, the virus affects the anterior horn cells, right? And therefore, it affects the motor. There should be no sensory, there should be no autonomic symptom, only pure motor. That's why they have atrophy of the muscles usually of the lower extremities, okay? Okay, uh, in terms of fungal, all the only thing I want you to study is the cryptococcal meningitis, all right? This is the most common cause of meningitis in HIV-positive patients, or AIDS patients, okay? You know, we, we, we can inhale cryptococcus neoformans, but because we have good immune system, then we don't get sick. Our macrophages, our T cells, our B cells, our antibodies will fight the fungus, the cryptococcus neoformans, and we don't get sick. 
Okay, the organism will die. But if you you are immunocompromised, you don't have enough immune defense system. Therefore, you can get sick. Okay, first it will go to your lungs, and okay, you may get sick with some kind of pneumonia, or maybe you're not going to get any respiratory symptoms. But then it can spread hematogenously to the brain and the meninges. Therefore, you end up having cryptococcal meningoencephalitis. The reality is it is usually a combination of meningitis and encephalitis, okay? The cryptococcus neoformans. And the organism is actually a spherical fungus with a thick capsule, all right? Look at the capsule, it's so thick, all right? That's why, this, and this is a chronic infection. This is not acute. Therefore, it will develop over a period of several months, okay? Especially in HIV-positive patients, okay? And then, you know, they will present with the classical uh, symptoms of meningitis, right? Neck like stiffness, fever, headache, okay? And when you do the lumbar puncture, if you're suspecting, if your patient is HIV positive, then think about cryptococcal meningitis first, all right? So you need to send the CSF. First of all, you can do the India ink, right? You All you need to do is take one drop or two drops of the CSF and then put one to two drops of the India ink and you will see the microorganisms. But this is not sensitive, okay? A lot of times you may not see anything and yet there is something, okay? So you need to send the uh, CSF for antigen, okay? CSF antigen and antibody, okay? And then you treat this with, okay, treatment. See, look at this. This is accumulation of the uh, fungi, okay? Okay, they may actually cause a focal lesion, cryptococcoma, just like TB, tuberculoma, okay, just like uh, syphilis, gamma, G U, eh, sorry, yeah, G U M M A. Okay, treatment is of course amphotericin B, combine it with flucytosin and eventually fluconazole. Okay, those three: amphotericin B, flucytosin, fluconazole. Okay, but remember that it can be recurrent, okay? So that's why doctors tend to do the fungal antifungal therapy for a long time, especially if the patient is HIV positive. Okay, and the, I've seen this many times, okay? And all of them died, unfortunately, okay? And then that's all you need to study in terms of fungus. In Rikecha, never mind, okay? Parasitic, okay? Please uh, study the is cirrhosis and toxoplasma, okay? Toxoplasmosis, right? These are the intracellular uh, parasites, right? Okay, and, uh, you know, this is uh, definitely associated with HIV if you are immunocompromised, okay? And they will present, you know, you can get the toxoplasma from contamination of your food and drink or you yourself, you're able to swallow them because of cat feces, etc., etc. okay? And, um Treatment is pyrimetamine with sulfadiazine and uh, leucovarine. All right. Remember, this is the one that causes ring enhancing lesions, right? See, you see the lesion and then the periphery or the rim is enhancing with contrast. Okay. So, rim enhancing lesions, what you need to remember about toxoplasmosis. Okay. Ring enhancing lesion, right? And then cat feces, uh, inadequately cooked uh, meat. And then uh, pyrimetamine, sulfadiazine, and leucovarine as treatment. Okay, HIV positive, AIDS associated with them. Okay, and uh, yeah, okay, and then uh, forget the malaria. One more, the neurocysticercosis. Let's try to find them. Okay, this is cirrhosis is okay, pork tapeworm, right? Okay, tinea solium. All right, so basically, uh, you know, this is more common in patients who, in people who eat uh, meat, pork meat, right? Or poorly uh, cooked uh, pork meat, okay, the tinea solume. Now, what happens is that you may ingest them, okay, contamination of your food or water, okay, and then this will turn into larvae, right? And the larvae will start migrating to different parts of the body, including the eyes and the brain, okay? And then once they go to the brain, okay, uh, they may cause headache, okay, because there were several lesions right, with surrounding edema, right? And when you do an MRI and it's a fresh lesion, then you can treat them with praziquantel, 
or albendazole, right? Or, you know, remember, you may treat them with glucocorticoids or prednisone or steroids, okay? Because the inflammation, when you uh, you may need to suppress them, and then when these okay, lesions rupture into the ventricles, then they may cause hydrocephalus. So to avoid the spilling of the rupture into the ventricles, then you need to give steroids, okay? And how will you how will you diagnose? Only by brain scan, nothing else, right? There's no need to do lumbar punctures, etc. But again, if you see fresh lesions with surrounding edema, you can treat them with the antiparasitic or antalmintic, such as praziquantel or arbendazole, plus the plus the glucocorticoids. But if the lesions are have been there for a while, all you're going to see is calcified lesions, calcification. Okay, not fresh lesions anymore. Just uh, you know, uh, small, round uh, signal intensity, and that's because of the um, calcifications, okay? If there's calcification already, that means the parasite is dead already. No need to give praziquantel or arbendazole. No need, right? Because they're dead already. They're calcified already. The only thing you need to treat is the seizure, right? You need to give phenytoin or dilantin, okay, to treat seizures. And a lot of times, you cannot really remove them because they're multiple. They're deep seated. You cannot do surgery to remove them, right? So they will be they will have epilepsy or seizure disorder already, and you have to treat them with medications for the rest of their lives, right? Okay. And then, of course, if there's headache, you can give paracetamol. Okay, but only if the lesions are fresh with surrounding lima, that's when you are going to give praziquantel, albendazole, and glucocorticoids. Okay. This is autopsy. Okay, after the patient dies. Okay, from the seizures, then, uh, you know, you will see all the cystic lesions. This is the classic, uh, this is schizomiasis. Okay, never mind. Okay, that's it for the neuroinfections. Prions, well, we will discuss them in dementia. Okay, let's go to the epilepsy. Epilepsy is so quick, right? So easy. Epilepsy. Okay, can you see the slides? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. When you say seizure, it, you are referring to the episode, okay? Oh, I had a seizure. Oh, my mom had a seizure. Oh, my daughter had a seizure. But a seizure refers to the episode. Now, getting one seizure does not mean you have epilepsy or seizure disorder already, okay? It's just, you know, in fact, they say that there's an unwritten law where all of us are allowed to have one seizure in our lifetime. Okay, so you don't have to treat. We treat only if you have epilepsy or seizure disorder. You have the disorder already, okay? But you need to investigate, okay? Because it can recur. That's a problem, okay? And when you say seizure disorder, it means you have the disorder already. You have the illness already, and therefore, you need to be treated with maintenance anticonvulsant or anti-epileptic, okay? Now, epilepsy is the same as seizure disorder, all right? The only thing is doctors uh, stay away from the term or, you know, uh, epilepsy because there's a stigma associated with it, right? If someone says, oh, this is a patient uh, who is epileptic, you know, then people will start avoiding you, right? Oh, I don't want to get so sit next to this person because if this person goes into a seizure, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to be involved. I don't want, I don't know what to do. Okay, so we tend to say seizure disorder rather than epilepsy, but really they are the same, okay? All right, so seizure is due to an electrical, excessive electrical activity in the brain, either one part of the brain or the entire brain, okay? So this is a, an electrical event, and patients can manifest with all sorts of symptoms, okay? And the most common type of seizure that we know is the grand mal seizure or generalized tonic-clonic seizure, okay? All right, now... Um, this is actually what we call uh, the hippocampus, okay? This is a highly epileptogenic focus in the brain. The hippocampus, okay? The mesial or medial or middle temporal lobe, okay? It is highly sensitive to low oxygen, highly sensitive to seizure focus, and therefore, this is a lot of times the origin of seizures, okay? So that when you do an MRI, you will see, okay, there is something abnormal here in the medial part of the temporal lobe, right? Here, if you're going to compare the medial part of the temporal lobe, you can see that there is atrophy here already compared to this one. Okay, there's atrophy here compared to this one. 
All right? And here, there's something abnormal compared to this one. And here, there's atrophy compared to this one. And again, they're saying that the temporal lobe really, especially the mesial or the medial or the middle temporal lobe is uh, highly epileptogenic. Okay? All right. Now, in terms of etiology, 85% of the time, seizures are idiopathic unknown cause. That's the majority. Only 15% of the time, there's a known cause. And what are some of the known causes? Of course, you know, metabolic abnormalities, hepatic encephalopathy, drug toxicity, eclampsia, okay, hypertensive encephalopathy, etc., etc. Okay, but the primary ones, you, we don't know. For example, febrile seizures. Okay, but what's causing it? We don't know. All right? Okay. And then, um, these are some of the primary neurological disorders, febrile seizure. And what's the definition of febrile seizure? It usually occurs in children six months to six years. Of course, in our PowerPoint, it's five years. Different books will tell different things. So I guess we will follow the PowerPoint. Months to five years. And the seizure is associated with fever. Okay, usually the temperature is about 38. Okay, and very important here is that you have to make sure that there is no intracranial infection. Okay, in order for you to use the term benign febrile convulsions or febrile seizures, you have to make sure there is no meningitis, there's no encephalitis, there's no brain abscess, right? Because if there is, then that's the cause of the seizure. It's not febrile seizure. The seizure is caused by the infection. Okay, all right. Now, it can be inherited. There's a familial tendency to it, okay? The seizure lasts for only 10 to 15 minutes, and there's no reason for you a lot of times, there's no reason for you to put this patient on anti-epileptics because these are benign, all right? And eventually, they will outgrow this. It will go away. But in some patients, okay, the seizure becomes complex, okay? Meaning that there's an abnormality in their brain, okay? The seizures are prolonged, all right, et cetera, et cetera. Then, you know, sometimes you have to treat them with seizure medications. But usually, benign febrile seizures you don't have to treat, okay? Some uh, mothers, because they know that their children had a seizure when they had a fever, then automatically they put them on um, paracetamol or, um, uh, you know, antipyretic. But you don't have to, okay? okay? But of course, you know, you need to treat the, the fever, of course, right? But even though it's only mild fever or, you know, you, the mother gets scared and then they uh, give the patient paracetamol every four hours, even though there's really no need to do that, okay? So don't panic. Okay, um, head trauma can cause seizures, of course. When you get traumatic injury to your head, it may cause, um, uh, you know, scar formation in the brain and that can remain silent for a long time, but then eventually it will start uh, causing excessive electrical activity. Okay, stroke can definitely cause seizures. Mass lesions such as brain tumor or abscess can cause seizures. Meningitis or encephalitis can cause seizures. Okay. Uh, some of the systemic disorders like hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, hypocalcemia, uremia, hepatic encephalopathy, all, drug overdose, all these things, systemic disorders, can actually cause seizures. Okay? All right. Um, now, there is what you call non-epileptic seizures or pseudo-seizures, right? Okay, remember how well you differentiate whether it's true seizure or not, pseudo-seizures or non-epileptic. Okay, it's more common in women because of their past trauma. Let's say they were rape victims or they had a traumatic childhood, they were, they were abused in their childhood, whatever it was, okay, it created a psychological problem. And now they're manifesting as non epileptic seizures. They're not actual seizures. So it is actually a malpractice to put them on seizure medicine because these are non epileptic. Now, how will you know, okay, in terms of manifestations? Okay, all right, number one. Okay, psychogenic uh, epileptic seizures, usually they are a stereotype, meaning a person with epilepsy, usually the seizures are the same uh, manifestations, okay? But with psychogenic, it varies, okay? Sometimes they lose consciousness, sometimes they just stare off into space, sometimes one side is jerking, the other side is not uh, jerking, so it becomes variable, okay? Then that's more psychogenic. And then duration, usually psychogenic, are more prolonged, okay? Sometimes a person is having grand mal seizure for one hour. By that time, the patient is already dead, right? So obviously, the person is faking it or it's just a pseudo-seizure, okay? And then epileptic seizures can happen at night or daytime. But with psychogenic seizures, usually they happen during the daytime. Why? Because they want people to witness, 
oh my God, I'm having a seizure. So help me. I want attention. Okay, so you usually during daytime. And then uh, epileptic seizures, they will injure themselves, right? They don't care whether they are, uh, you know, on top of a bed. If they have a seizure, they will fall, right? With epileptic, uh, with non-epileptic seizures or psych- pseudo seizures, psychogenic seizures, they will try to avoid injury. Like for example, if they're having a seizure, what you can do is lift up their arm or hand and then put it on top of their face and then release it. Okay, so they will try to avoid hitting their face. Okay, so that's fake. Okay, another one is the eyes. Okay, in real seizures, the eyes are actually open, right? Okay, when a person's having a seizure, the eyes are rolled back, but they are open. You can only see the white. Okay, but with psychogenic seizure, they will really try to close their eyes. Even if you try to open them, they will re- uh, try to fight you, right? So that's fake already. Another one is the presence of urinary or fecal incontinence. Okay, it's more common in epileptic seizures, but in non-epileptic, they're not going to poop. They're not going to urinate in bed, right? They will try to avoid that. Okay, and then um, prolonged loss of muscle tone. Okay, it's common in psychogenic seizures. Okay, because they're faking it. Okay, post-ictal confusion, you only see that in real seizures. Okay, but with epilep, with with uh, uh, psychogenic seizures. After the seizure, they are alert already. They're awake. So you can tell that's fake, okay? And sometimes they even cry, okay? Because they need attention, right? And then um, the most important thing to do is to do an EEG during the seizure, okay? Really, this is the best way to do. Of course, you can differentiate by looking at the patient, observing. But the best way is to do an EEG during the seizure, and if you see epileptiform discharges, okay, then that's probably a real seizure. But if you see a normal EEG and the person is shaking, then you know that's fake. Another thing is remember when you see uh, uh, tongue biting, right? In real seizures, they bite their tongue on the side. Okay, just like us, when we accidentally okay, bite our tongue, we bite it on the side. But with them, they actually bite their tongue at the tip because you know it's, they did that on purpose. Okay, you cannot really bite your tongue on the side, can you? You cannot, right? Okay, so, so that's another way of differentiating. Now, how will you differentiate seizures? Okay, there is what generally, there is what to call generalized and there's partial or focal. When you say generalized, it means that the entire brain, both hemispheres are involved at the very beginning. Whereas partial or focal means that the seizure starts from a certain part of the brain only, either the left frontal lobe, the right hemisphere, the left temporal lobe, etc., etc., okay? <clears throat> and the uh, generalized, okay, under that you have the generalized chronic chronic, the most common, or grand mal. There's absence or petit mal, okay? This is more common in children where when the patient goes into absence, the, the person, the patient, the child stops doing whatever he's doing and then he just stares off into space or starts wandering into space, okay? And when you call your little brother, he doesn't even look at you because he's having a seizure, okay? Sometimes they are mistaken as being daydreaming, uh, he's not paying attention, the teacher gets mad. But really, the problem is the patient is having a seizure, okay? All right, myochronic seizures, meaning the entire, uh, upper, usually the upper part of the body jerks. So it's a group of muscles, the shoulder muscles, the head and neck muscles, okay? Uh, the arms, okay, they jerk, okay? That's myoclonus. A tonic seizure means they suddenly lose muscle tone, they lose consciousness, and fall to the ground. But they don't shake or they don't go into generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Okay? Partial or focal, again, like I said, it comes from a certain part of the brain only. So it can be simple or, uh, sorry, it can be, uh, yeah, simple or complex. And when you say simple, it means that consciousness or, or awareness of the patient is preserved meaning the patient is awake. The patient knows that he's having a seizure, but he's awake. For example, you're writing something and then suddenly your right arm goes into uh, jerking, right? So that's actually a simple motor seizure. Or if you're writing something and suddenly you feel electrical uh, uh, pencil sensation or electrical sensation in the right arm, lasting for only one minute, then that can be a simple sensory seizure, okay? So you are aware. But complex... Just like absence, okay, complex means that you are not aware that you're having a seizure, okay? And this is the type of seizure where patients have an aura or a warning. Before they get a seizure, 
they smell something or they have olfactory hallucination like a burning tire or they get a, a discomfort in the epigastric region, which is the most common type of aura in seizure, okay? So they get all sorts of warning before they go into the seizure itself. Now, a simple or focal, sorry, a partial or focal seizure can generalize, okay? Meaning it will start only in one hemisphere, but then eventually it will spread to the other. So both uh, hemispheres are involved, so they lose consciousness, okay? So that is what we call secondary generalization. Okay, it started as focal or partial, but then eventually it becomes generalized, but it is only secondary. All right, this is a sample of generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Okay. By the way, you can get just the tonic phase, generalized tonic, or you may get generalized chronic, or the most common is generalized tonic first and then chronic. Okay, when you do an EEG, you see epileptiform discharges, spike or sharp waves in all the leads. Okay, and this is followed by a post confusion. When they wake up from the seizure, they are confused. They may cry a little bit, okay? They complain of a bad headache, and they have muscle aches because of the stiffening of the muscles or joint pains. So when you witness something like this, that like really violent shaking, do not control it, okay? Do not hold them down, okay? Because you are going to cause dislocation of the shoulder, of the hip, or fracture, okay? So just let them go into a seizure. But of course, you need to at least maybe get a pillow, put them on a flat surface, not on top of the bed, okay? And then you put a, a small pillow, not too high, okay? On the head, so at least there's no... Uh, hitting or head trauma. Now, you need to turn them to the side because they may drool and then that may cause aspiration. So turn the entire body to the side. Don't just turn the head. You may injure the spine, okay? Turn the entire body to the side and in case this may vomit, then, you know, it uh, doesn't go into the lungs. And then don't put anything into their mouth because that's going to block the airway. Okay? Bring them to the ER if you have Okay, now this is the EEG of absence, right? Um, uh, yeah, typical absence. Absence is three hertz spike in wave, which means that if you're going to look at this area between the two big lines, okay, you will see three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. This is the classical EEG finding in absence seizure, okay? It's called three hertz spike and wave okay you get a spike and then a wave spike and wave spike and wave spike and wave okay and there are three per second okay the duration between the two lines is actually one second and you get three spike and wave this is absence okay and this one is general uh, uh well absence also but you know there is no uh there are no lines that's why you don't see okay myoclonus again is sudden jerking of group of muscles, usually the upper body. So if they're sitting down, they don't necessarily fall to the floor or to the ground because usually it's only the upper body that jerks or twitches. All right, the head and neck, the arms, okay. Uh, we did have a student while taking uh, uh, an exam, okay. Uh, I think it's a oral exam, practical exam or something. And then because of the tension or the stress, then he went into a myoclonic seizure, which is his usual seizure. Okay, plus you know he studied the night before, so there's a lot of stress, there's la lack of sleep. So and then he did not eat breakfast, therefore he went into a myoclonic seizure. Okay, all right. So you'll drop things from your grip, and then the upper part of your body will become tense, but it's very quick, very rapid. See, that's why when you do EEG, you only see this once, and then it stops. Unless you get another one, and then another one, and another one. Okay, all right. The drug of choice for this one is valproic acid. And by the way, the best medicine for generalized seizures, valproic acid. Okay, take note. The best uh, medicine for partial seizure, carbamazepine. Okay, and which one is the most teratogenic? Valproic acid. Okay, a lot of these seizure medicines can cause neural tube defects. All right. Now, this is what I'm talking about. When you get focal seizure, all right, the seizure starts from there, eh, but then it can rapidly spread to the other hemisphere. Now you have secondary generalization. Okay, sometimes the lesion is here, but it goes down to the thalamus, and then the thalamus will project bilaterally. So again, ending in secondary 
generalization. Okay, all right. What else do you need to know about seizures? Uh, this is an example of a partial seizure. As you can see, you have uh, sharp waves and spikes only in the temporal lobe. See, if you're going to look at the leads, you have T4 here, T4 here, T6, right? So mainly temporal. And it's even number, so it's the right temporal lobe. Okay, odd number is the left. Okay, and here also, right? You see uh, sharp waves, spike waves. Okay, if you look here, it's it's mainly in the temporal T10. Okay, so really it's in the right temporal lobe. Whereas this one is absence, the three hertz, okay? Spike and wave, spike and wave, spike and wave, and there are three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay. This is, um, what is this? Oh, never mind that. Okay. All right. I think that's it for initial evaluation. You know, already the best thing to do in terms of workup is there are two tests that are basic, MRI and EEG. MRI, because you want to look at the structure of the brain. EEG, because you want to look at the electrical activity of the brain, okay? All right, and lastly, let's go to the, it's the same PowerPoint that you have in the portal, okay? If you are taking notes, then the questions will come from whatever I discuss, all right? Let's go to, now for neuroinflammatory, all you need to do, to do is study MS, okay? No need to study the Covernant Sinus Syndrome, the hemor acute hemorrhagic leukoencephalitis, just MS or multiple sclerosis, okay? All right, remember that MS is, uh, you know, a leading cause of disability in young adults, especially women, okay? And the problem here is that once you're diagnosed with MS, you will have MS for life. You cannot erase it anymore. It's like diabetes, right? Okay, you will have it for life until the end of your life, okay? And the problem here is that the ultimate effect is disability, all right? You will end up being in a wheelchair or be, being bedridden or being very dependent on other people, okay? And the, uh, it's a worldwide disease, although it's more common in Caucasians compared to other races, but it doesn't mean we can't get it, okay? Here in the Philippines, there are uh, some patients with MS and they belong to a society, okay? They form a group so they can help each other, okay? So in other words, MS can affect any race, okay? But it's more common in Caucasians. It's more common in women. It's more common in the age group 40s to 60s, all right? And it's more common in uh, countries close to the North Pole, all right? Close to the North Pole, those European countries, et cetera, et cetera. So they say that the closer you are to the North Pole, the higher the risk of getting MS, or the closer you are to the equator, okay, the less chance of getting MS, okay? So, so far that's true, but do we know exactly what's causing it? We know, okay? They just, you know, do research to find out what really is causing MS. Now, this is related to a demyelination okay, process, meaning that there is loss of myelin sheath in the neurons and therefore the brain starts malfunctioning depending on the location of the lesions. The lesions are called MS plaques or multiple sclerosis plaques or white matter plaques. It's a, strictly a white matter disease. okay, And uh, there is no single test that will diagnose MS, right? Unlike, for example, uh, bacterial meningitis. Right? If we do lumbar puncture and then the culture, TS of culture shows Neisseria meningitis, that's it, right? But with MS, there's no single test. Okay? MRI will help, but it will not definitively tell you that it's MS. Okay? Same thing with lumbar puncture. Same thing with the, you know, the evoke potentials. All right? But the, um, what we know is it's a demyelination, meaning the myelin sheet is being destroyed or damaged by the immune cells because it's an autoimmune disorder, okay? And, uh, you know, see, look at this. This is a normal uh, myelin, okay? And here, the, the myelin sheet is damaged, destroyed, therefore, the axon is exposed, okay? And these are the, the myelination plaques. Remember that MS plaques have a predilection. Usually, you see them in the periventricular area around the ventricles, or in the corpus callosum, okay? 
So they have a predilection. But of course, you can see in any white matter, as long as there's white matter, okay, that can be MS. But there's a predilection. Okay, see, look at this lesion around the ventricles. And this is a, uh, you know, uh, higher magnification, and you can see all these lymphocytes, especially T cells. There are too many. This is a demarcation of an MS plaque. You see the myelin uh, being, I mean, you see the inflammatory cells, too many. And this is the area where it's normal, okay? All right. Now, of course, it's a uh, central uh, nervous system disease. Therefore, it affects the brain or the spinal cord or both, right? Look at these MS plaques. They are distinct lesions that are periventricular around the ventricles. See? Okay. Or it can be found in the corpus callosum. Okay. Again, it can be found anywhere as long as there's white matter, but it has a predilection for periventricular area and the corpus callosum area. Now, it can also affect the spinal cord. Okay. And uh, global distribution, again, as you can see, high risk, the red. So they're all close to the North Pole. Of course, in Japan, okay. And what are the suspected predisposing factors? Okay, vitamin D. Okay, they're saying, how come it's, it's common in countries close to the North Pole, the temperate regions, the cold regions? Well, probably because they have less, less exposure to the sun. So maybe it's because of low vitamin D levels, vitamin D. That's one observation that they have. Of course, that's not a theory. That's just an observation. Okay. Another thing is it is uh, a lot of them with MS are chronic smokers. So they're saying maybe smoking has to do with it. Okay. Another thing that they have found is a lot of them have history of Epstein-Barr Epstein virus infection, like infectious mononucleosis. Okay. A lot of them actually have, uh, you know, some kind of gastrointestinal uh, micro, uh, no, like gastrointestinal dysbiogenesis, okay, or dysbiosis, meaning there's some kind of gastrointestinal abnormality. You're not smoking, but remember that these are all uh, hypotheses, not theories. Okay. And there's a genetic susceptibility. Okay. Of course, MS is not really genetic. Not, more people are affected with it you know, as an acquired condition. Okay? But there's a genetic susceptibility in some patients, okay? especially in uh, chromosome 6, short arm. Okay? But it's an interplay between genetics and environment. Okay? Like I said, in the freshly harvested brain of someone who died from complications of MS, you will see all these pinkish lesions and you see them periventricular and they're gel gelatin like and the problem is that's why you call it multiple sclerosis right because there are multiple lesions and it's very difficult to diagnose one reason is there are multiple lesions so you cannot localize one lesion may be in the cerebellum one lesion may be in the pons one lesion may be in the internal capsule one other lesion may be you know there are multiple lesions that's why it's difficult to localize so it's hard to um, diagnose okay even the optic nerve for some reason it has a predilection for involving the optic nerve okay see look at this lesion uh, these are periventricular gelatin like lesions Okay, even the spinal cord can get affected, see? It can wipe out some parts of the spinal cord and therefore it will affect the tracts of the spinal cord, right? Lateral spinothalami, corticospinal, depending on the tract that is involved, and then that's how the patient will manifest. Okay, it's an interplay of the inflammatory cells, especially T cells. Okay, the spinal cord, now here, it's wiping out pretty much the entire half of the spinal cord. Therefore, this may present as brown sequard syndrome, right? The hem hemisection of the spinal cord. This one affects the dorsal column. And therefore, this patient with MS will present with a lot of falling because of impairment in proprioception. And of course, vibration also. Okay? Now, uh, they may have, not always present, but they may have nerve myth sign. Nerve myth sign is when they... Uh, bend their neck forward. 
okay? Then they will feel an electrical shock sensation coming from the neck going down the spine. That's what you call the remit sign. But this is only present if they have a lesion in the cervical spinal cord. Okay? All right, so a lot of times, they may present with tingling sensation, numbness, cold sensation in the legs, okay? Um, okay, the most common is sensory disturbance. Okay, and then next is weakness. They tend to have weakness in the legs and the arms or whatever. And then, of course, visual loss because of the involvement of the optic nerve. And then they may have ataxia because of cerebellar lesion or the spinal cord lesion, diplopia, double vision, vertigo, and then fatigue, facial pain, headache. Okay, these are some of the common symptoms of MS. Okay, the optic neuritis, as you can see, the optic nerve here is fine, but here it is, there's an increased signal and it is swollen. Okay, so, you know, the way they present is usually is the visual, that the, uh, that the, the first symptom is visual, right? They may have sudden blindness in one eye, and even without seeing a doctor, after two days, after three days, it may go away. Okay, but it's actually the start of optic neuritis already, which may predispose you to uh, MS, developing MS later. Okay, and how will you know that? If let's say you develop optic neuritis, okay, and then your doctor wants to know if you are going to develop multiple sclerosis later. So you need to do an MRI. And if the MRI shows lesions in the brain, then 90% of the time, this patient will develop multiple sclerosis later. Okay. Of course, they may have tremors, a toxic gait, okay, the uh, internuclear optomoplegia, okay, nystagmus in one eye, and then failure to adduct in one eye, in another eye. Okay, because of the involvement of the MLF. Remember this, okay? Medial longitudinal fasciculus. All right, they may have fatigue, vertigo, and then facial pain like pedemonal neuralgia. Okay, bladder and bowel dysfunction. They may have facial paralysis. Okay, spasms in the arms and legs. Okay, they may have uh, uh, facial myokymia, meaning twitching or contraction of the uh, facial muscles like the orbicularis oculi as if they are twitching. Okay, you know how sometimes when we study, we stay late at night, following morning, our eye twitches. Okay, that's common. Now, there are different forms of MS, okay? There is what to call, uh, the most common is the relapsing remitting. Okay, this is the most common uh, uh, form of MS. Relapsing remitting is they get a relapse and then uh, after treatment, they go away. They, in, they are in remission. And then they get a relapse again, remission, relapse, remission. But as you can see, it's going up because Okay, this is a progressive disease. There's no way that you are going will keep on destroying and destroying and destroying your brain until you end up being severely disabled, either in a wheelchair or bedridden. Okay. And then of course the other types are primary progressive, meaning you get an attack and then you don't go back to normal. You just keep getting worse and worse from there. That's what you call primary progressive MS. Okay. Another type is what we call secondary progressive meaning you get an attack and then after you get a second attack, you keep getting worse from there. That's secondary progressive. Now, progressive relapsing means that, as you can see, look at this, progressive, okay, relapsing as opposed to primary progressive. Okay, but the most common type of all is the relapsing remitting. Okay. Now, how will you treat MA? There are three types of treatment. This is a rating scale for disability. Normal, okay, and then eventually death. You become bedbound, wheelchair bound, and you use a cane. Okay, you have limitations in your ambulation, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the EDSS or expanded disability status scale that we, we use, okay, to, uh, you know, categorize MS. And, you know, in other countries like the U.S., for example, they are special, right? Patients with MS, they get free installation of air conditioner, okay? Because they have a tendency to get worse when they are exposed to hot temperature, okay? And that's what you call Utoff phenomenon, Utoff phenomenon, U-T-H-O-F-F, -F, Utoff phenomenon, okay? All right, and then how will you treat MS? Okay, one is by uh, treating an attack. 
Okay, if you get an attack, where is that now? Okay, this one. If you get an attack, then you're going to give steroids, okay? Methylprednisolone, IV. Okay, because it's an anti-inflammatory, right? So you want to suppress the active inflammation. And then the patient will get better. But then that's going to that's not going to prevent another attack down the road. Maybe next year or maybe in two years, you'll get another attack. Okay, and another attack in three years. You know, so you need to be on a what we call kind of similar to prophylaxis or preventive medicine for migraines and for seizures, right? Okay, so um you need to give um uh what you call this um disease modifying treatments. Okay, that's how, you, how we call it. Okay, this is modifying treatments are actually uh, some of them, a lot of them are actually toxic, okay, because they're highly uh, immunosuppressive. Okay, so uh, you want to put them on these types of medicines to suppress the immune system. Okay, and a lot of them are injections. Okay, you give the injections. Okay, uh, depending on the type of injection, you can give it every day or three times a day or once a week. Okay. But the purpose there is to prevent uh, relapses. Okay. All right. Another type of treatment. So one is glucocorticoids, right? For an acute treatment. And then to prevent relapses, you want to give the disease-modifying treatments like the immunosuppressive drugs, right? And then the third treatment is supportive. All right. Meaning that you want to give something, uh, you know, to uh, as a supportive treatment. For example, there's pain, you can give something for the pain. If there is a spasm, you can give something for the spasm. All right, so that's what you call supportive treatment. And then uh, how will you diagnose MS? Of course, number one is symptoms, right? Okay, you must have uh, multiple events in your life. Okay, a lot of times um, they have sensory symptoms and then weakness and then visual. All right, and then it's more common in women compared to men, 30s to uh, 40s to, um, sorry, 20s to 40s. Did I say 40s to 60s? 20s to 40s, okay, 20s to 40s. And... Um, usually Caucasians, okay? And again, it can affect any race, all right? So really, the symptoms are very important, okay? Second is by doing an MRI, you will see the MS plaques, right? The white matter lesions. And then third is lumbar puncture. You do lumbar puncture because you want to look for oligoclonal bands. These are the oligoclonal bands, okay? All right? But these are not specific for MS because sometimes meningitis and cephalitis can show oligoclonal bands, so they're not specific. Now, evoked potentials is another way of diagnosing it, okay? One is what we call the visual evoked potential. The other one is the, this is the visual, and then the other, another one is the brainstem auditory evoked uh, potential. Okay, what it is is, basically, you are testing the visual pathway and the auditory pathway, okay? So if there's a slowing, then, you know, this is suggestive of multiple sclerosis. That's why in patients with symptoms, and yet, Okay, and yet spinal tap is normal, MRI is very vague, then you may do evoke potential. And if it's positive or abnormal, then you can make a diagnosis of MS. Okay? All right, that's it. I think we're done. See, this is what I'm talking about, okay? Treatments, these are the interferons, okay? These are the disease-modifying therapies. Interferons, okay, infusions, the pills. And then, of course, glucocorticoid is for an actual uh, uh, relapse, okay, an acute infect, uh, acute uh, phase, all right, and then of course supportive therapy. Okay, no need to go through the specific uh, medications. Okay, I think we're done. This is study. I don't know if you guys are recording me because you know if you record me, my questions will come from whatever I mentioned because it means those are important. Okay. Of course, you know, if you are going to read the PowerPoint, then good for you. You may even get perfect score. Okay, but please study hard because this is your last chance to pass the module. You know how strict in is, okay? If you fail, then you failed. Right? Okay, I will let you go now because it's called 10. Thank you very much for listening and I will see you again tomorrow, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. Okay. Tomorrow, uh, to, towards the end... Tomorrow, towards the end of our lecture, we will uh, give do a quick uh, review of what might come out in the uh, exam. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you, Doc. 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 Doc.
ولیکئ.